tonight. If he declares a national emergency, it's my hope that the courts and or Congress will stop him quickly. There are children being held in prison here. This is a concentration camp. This is incredible, high-powered, brightly lit, LED-powered snake oil. While arguing that Paul Manafort hasn't breached his plea deal, the defense team for the former Trump campaign chair managed to bungle the redactions in their court filing and accidentally revealed what he's been accused of, lying about sharing Trump campaign polling data with Konstantin Kalimnik, who the FBI thinks is tied to Russian intelligence. Funeral services were held in Houston for Jasmine Barnes, a seven-year-old murdered last week in a drive-by shooting. Police have two suspects in custody, the alleged shooter and a man who prosecutors say admitted to driving him. While police say they believe the two didn't intend to target the family, both men have been charged with capital murder. America's carbon dioxide emissions increased by 3.4% in 2018, the biggest jump in eight years. Independent researchers say that while a record number of American coal plants went dark last year, natural gas usage, as well as emissions from diesel and jet engines, managed to make up the difference. National Security Advisor John Bolton was in Ankara today, meeting his Turkish counterpart, but President Recep Tayyip Erdogan apparently refused to see Bolton. Instead, he blasted him in Parliament for adding a condition to the American withdrawal from Syria that Turkey promised not to harm the Kurdish fighters that America considers allies and who Erdogan considers terrorists. John Bolton, çok ciddi bir yanlış yapmıştır. Kim bu şekilde düşünüyorsa, onlar da yanlış içerisindedir. Since June 2018, the Department of Health and Human Services and a private contractor called BCFS have operated a massive tent city on the edge of Tornillo, a little town on the Texas-Mexico border. Officially, it's a migrant youth shelter for unaccompanied minors ages 13 to 17 who've made unauthorized crossings into the United States. Unofficially, it's a prison for kids. But whatever you call it, its operations have been highly secretive. So they're flying in front of the tents of Tornillo. I look at those birds, I've been looking at those birds and thinking every time I see them that the birds are free and the kids are not. They're migrating. You've heard of that, right? <laughs> birds do it, people do it. Josh Rubin moved to Texas to protest and publicize what was happening at Tornillo. Was it like this when you got here? No, it's hot as hell. <laughs> After spending three months there, Josh is going home. In late December, weeks after it was revealed that HHS neglected to ensure fingerprint checks were conducted on workers, it was announced that Tornillo's contract would not be renewed. And now it's starting to tear the camp down. Vice News has learned that Tornillo is housing just 850 children, down from over 2,800 it held at its height. The federal government has released so little information about what goes on inside Tornillo that the best insight into the camp is a guy who's been standing watch outside its gates. It's garbage. Yes, garbage. And garbage. Well, actually, not garbage. That looks like another cherry picker, doesn't it? Yeah. What, and what does a cherry picker do? Well, you have to get high to lower the beams of these tents. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's kind of a painstaking process. These are such big tents. So seeing this coming in to you indicates that they're... Seeing that going out. Oh, yeah. What's that? That's a, that's a mobile office. Huh. I don't think they have any mobile offices left in there. This is a secret that horrifies most of us, you know. There are children being held in prison here. And I figured if they have a secret like this, the best thing to do to, to counter it is to uh, bring it to light. How did you swing three months away from work? Or like, what do you do for a living? What's your day job? Well, I'm a software developer. You know, I'm also old. You know, I'm 66 years old. <laughs> I am at an age where conceivably I could retire. So this is your first step to retirement? Strangely enough. Uh, well, it might be. Well, a lot of people like they'll uh, go on vacation. Right. I, you, I, I, I go to concentration camps at the border. Concentration camps? Yes. You'd, you'd say it that plainly. Well, why not? We've concentrated a population, isolated by ethnic group, but they live under severely re regimented condition. This is a concentration camp. I mean, some people prefer internment camp. Some people prefer prison. They put it down here in this remote spot in the Chihuahuan Desert. There's a reason for being out here in the middle of nowhere. What is that reason? They don't want us to see. They didn't want us to see. But we saw. And now they're closing it down. 
HHS declined our request for a tour, but has stated, quote, Our plan is to safely release unaccompanied children at Tornillo to suitable sponsors or transfer them to a permanent shelter. But even as the camp closes down, what's going on inside remains a secret. You better get off the property now. Okay, sir. Move it. We're just interested in learning what it's like for you as the camp is shutting down. Over the last week alone, more than a thousand children have been removed from the facility. But there's no indication what proportion of kids are going to families or ending up in other shelters. In the time we spent there, we saw scores of children shuttled out of the camp to federal court facilities in downtown El Paso, and many others to the airport. I knew that using a place like this was an opening. It was a, a, an opportunity to open hearts, showing kids playing soccer, showing kids whose faces told you right away they were no threat. But with reports that another existing overflow camp for kids in Florida may be adding a thousand new beds and advertising a hundred new jobs, the infrastructure of the highly secretive, large-scale detention of unaccompanied minors persists. I am proud to shut down the government. It's possible that we'll have a shutdown. Shutdown, shutdown, shutdown. I don't call it a shutdown. You can call it the Schumer or the Pelosi or the Trump shutdown doesn't make any difference to me. The president will make a speech from the Oval Office tonight, laying out the case again for his border wall of steel. Earlier today, Vice President Mike Pence previewed how the president would make that case by framing what's going on as a, quote, humanitarian and security crisis. 60,000 people are now attempting to come into our country illegally every month. That's more than 2,000 a day. So the vast majority of those people now are families and unaccompanied children, and it simply is overwhelming the ability of our Customs and Border Patrol. Now, Pence was careful in his language in a way some of his colleagues haven't been, so his numbers aren't wrong. According to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, by the end of 2018, Border Patrol agents were either apprehending or turning away about 60,000 people a month at the southwest border. That's up from about 40,000 a month at the same time in 2017. But as dramatic as Pence's 2,000 a day figure sounds, remember that includes people who are getting turned away at the border when they present themselves at a port of entry. The number of undocumented immigrants actually getting into the country and then taken into custody is way down historically. It peaked at 1.6 million in 2000. By 2018, it had dropped to about 400,000. The number of undocumented immigrants living in the U.S. has been trending down too. It was at about 10.7 million in 2016, down from 12.2 million in 2007. Putting the numbers in context undercuts an argument that the president and his allies seem to be preparing to make, that the situation at the southern border should be declared a national emergency which could give Trump special powers to spend money on the wall without congressional approval. Have you considered using emergency powers to grant yourself authorities to build this wall without congressional approval? Yes, I have, and I can do it if I want. Elizabeth Goitine is a lawyer who's worked for the Democratic side of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Justice Department. She says the president has almost complete discretion to declare a national emergency. He gets access to uh, special powers that are uh, contained in more than 100 different provisions of law that have been passed over the decades. Um, and you know those powers really run the gamut. So these are extremely broad powers um, that could really, that are very susceptible to abuse. Uh, and in some ways, we've really been fortunate up until now that we haven't seen more abuse of these powers. Do any of those laws authorize building the wall? Well, there are certainly a couple of laws that have been floated. One of them allows the Secretary of Defense to undertake military construction projects that have not otherwise been authorized. If you look at closer, I don't think either of these laws is a perfect fit. And I think they would both be quite vulnerable to, to legal challenge. And of course, there would be lawsuits immediately. The Democrats will and have called this an abuse of authority at best and an illegal overreach at worst. But that overreach might also be the best way to get them and the president out of this shutdown mess. Now go with me here for a second. The president declares his national emergency, making military construction money available to start to build a wall. That takes the wall out of Congress's hands and potentially allows them to pass bills to reopen the government, bills that hopefully the president would sign. 
Democrats would get to rail against the president for abusing his power, while not having to worry about their own responsibility for the shutdown. The White House gets to say the Democrats aren't addressing the crisis on our border, and construction on the wall probably wouldn't even start because the emergency order and spending authority would immediately be challenged in court. So the border fight goes squarely back to the arena of politics. It stays alive as an emotional and symbolic issue in the 2020 campaign, and one that both sides think is a winner for them. It's admittedly a pretty crass theory, and Goitin argues that there's more at stake here. I think every time the president acts in a way that is an abuse of power, it has an impact, even if it's ultimately stopped uh, in the courts or elsewhere, even if it doesn't end up going anywhere. I think, especially as they accumulate over time and people almost become numb to them, I think the damage, the long-term damage to our democracy is really, really significant. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un put on his fedora and waved goodbye from his armored personal train as he headed to China for his fourth visit in less than a year. It's something of a birthday treat for Kim, who's believed to have turned 35 today. Not that you'd know it from the country's official calendar, where it doesn't even get a mention. In fact, the last time we know that Kim got a shout out on his special day was five years ago from this guy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. If the awkward clapping didn't clue you in, North Koreans were probably unsure why Dennis Rodman was singing. State News only explained it as a touching song that showed Rodman's reverence for the man he's called a friend for life. The state cover-up may not seem that strange for North Korea, but it is a little weird considering there's no expense spared for other birthdays in the Kim Dynasty. They're national holidays. For his grandpa Kim Il-sung, North Koreans pull out pom-poms, party hats, and ballistic missiles. Kim's dad, Kim Jong-il, gets a day of bouquets and bands. Not so for this supreme leader. There's a lot of speculation about why his birthday isn't a national holiday. But these things are not done randomly in North Korea. They are all part of the building of the cult of personality, all part of the propaganda, and things are laid out step by step well in advance in North Korea. Theories about why Kim doesn't make a fuss about his birthday include everything from January's too cold, he's too modest, or he just doesn't have the same fan base as his dad. The most likely theory? It's not the right time. The language around even establishing a decree to make these birthdays a national holiday requires that you have a certain number of accomplishments or achievements. So if you look at it that way, there probably are a couple more things that Kim Jong-un needs to accomplish. So, he might not be a birthday guy now, but that doesn't mean he won't be later. It's just, it wouldn't look good to be the one throwing his own party. In the past, we saw Kim Jong-il building up his father's legacy. So the question is, who's going to do it for Kim Jong-un? And I think we're going to start to see his younger sister, Kim Yo-jong, is going to be in that position. Once we start to see her playing the role that Kim Jong-il played for his father, that's when we'll start to see the cult of personality toward his birthday being established. And when that day comes, what kind of present do you even give the supreme leader of North Korea? Kim Jong-un definitely wants to associate himself with technology. So if I were looking to give Kim Jong-un a gift, an Apple Watch would be something he'd like. You can see the winds, how powerful they are right now, David. This is a massive storm. I gotta tell you, that really hurts to stand there and do that. Yeah, I'm gonna put my jacket on. Woo! 
This morning, IBM announced it's going to start predicting the weather using your cell phone. It says in some parts of the world, forecasts will be five times more precise and update four times as often. This is the first model that's of any significance that's being introduced with crowdsourced data. And most people don't even know their smartphone has a barometer in it. Forecasters have got their data from the same sources for the last 50 years. Satellites, weather balloons, and stations on the ground and sea. But those resources are rarer in rural areas and developing countries. For example, the IBM-owned weather company pulls data from 1,000 weather stations in the U.S. and only 30 in India. But the Weather Channel app is used by millions of people in India. So the new program can gather barometric pressure readings from those cell phones and send them to a supercomputer that turns the data into forecasts. It's really moving us from the very traditional data sources to crowdsourced data, and that's a big deal. IBM plans to sell this rich data set to airlines, shipping companies, and others, provided they can get users to consent. We're collecting from people that agree to provide it to us via our app, the Weather Channel app. One of the questions that we pose to them is about access to location data. And we're very clear about how we use that location data. But the language about data sharing on the app is buried several pages deep. And hours after we conducted this interview, the city of Los Angeles filed a lawsuit against the weather company, accusing it of already deceptively scraping and selling location data to advertisers and hedge funds. IBM declined our request for a follow-up interview, but sent a statement defending their data sharing practices. The hologram industry has spent the last decade raising famous people from the dead. From Tupac's cameo at Coachella, to Amy Winehouse and Roy Orbison's new tours. Alki David is the founder and CEO of Hologram USA. One of many enterprises he's bankrolled with his billion dollar fortune as the heir to a Greek Coca-Cola bottling empire. It's one of several burgeoning hologram companies and possibly the first to make a noticeable dent in the industry. So what is the tech for something like this? So the tech is a 200-year-old parlor trick used in theater to project a ghost onto a stage by using an angled glass and creating an illusion that the audience thinks that something that they're seeing reflected from one place to another is a magical apparition. Right, this is incredible, high-powered, brightly lit, LED-powered snake oil. Hologram USA has done partnerships with Universal Theme Parks, Jimmy Kimmel Live, and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. You ain't seen nothing yet. But Alki didn't originate any of this technology. He just bought a bunch of patents. When we first started, we were the only game in town, so it was easy to be able to book somebody uh, like Whitney Houston, for example, uh, for a relatively small amount of money. I've bought uh, currently maybe 20 plus famous dead people, right? The patents Alki owns have real world impact beyond entertainment. In 2014, Hologram USA and its European partner, Musion, allowed Narendra Modi to appear at more than 800 rallies across India. To millions of voters, who then elected him as prime minister. Narendra Modi was elected with a 67% majority against a party that had been in power for 30 years solely because we orchestrated that whole thing and really showed how powerful this illusion can be. Alki's latest production peddles all of his properties at once. His live hologram tech, the roster of dead celebrities, and of course, a line of CBD concessions. It's LA in a prime tourist zone and some of the people attending the show weren't sure what they were there to see. Some just wandered in off the street. Either way, he could have probably used a few more rehearsals. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the headless uh, Scott Disick. Listen, if you don't fix this fucking camera, I'm going to come and I'm going to stick it in your ass. That's got to be sexual harassment. Backwards. You get in line for lawsuits. There you go. All right, thank you. You find your, fu your, your fucking pair of morons. But there are some things practice can't fix, like Alki's reputation. He's been the subject of numerous lawsuits, several of them still open, charging him with a litany of offenses, 
sexual harassment, sexual battery, common law battery, racial, marital, and sex discrimination, and retaliation. Many were filed by former employees. There are a number of suits against you, sexual harassment, battery. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, battery, there's no battery. No battery? No battery. I think I saw that in a suit. M maybe, maybe, maybe. Anybody like me, if you Google anybody with money, they've got a string of these lawsuits against them because this is how people operate these days. For the most part, I, I settled once, um, but I'll never do it again because that was a signal to people to say, you know, open season on algae. So do you think that those claims are unsubstantiated? Yeah, of course they are. Of course they are. And, and you know what? Time will tell, because each one of them, I won't settle with anybody. I'm a good employer. I have four sons, a stepdaughter, and a new baby on the way soon. I think I'm a good father, I'm a good human being, I'm a good person for me. I, I have a t-shirt that says, hashtag why me, right? And I also have a t-shirt that says, hashtag fuck me too as well. Uh, really, truly. I, you me know, too as in like, the Me Too movement? Yeah, fuck Me Too, like in other words, fuck me over as well. Oh, okay. You know, right? This is the frontier stage for holograms, and eccentric characters like Alki David are part of the genesis of the industry. Thank you, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. For the fucking delay of these morons who can't get it right! Oh, I'm gonna do it. Should probably take some oh. of your oils. But it's hard to predict if this form of entertainment can ever be taken seriously or reach its full potential with Alki leading the charge. I know who I am, and I'm, I like who I am. You've got Alki David in the media, Alki David, Dr. Evil, uh, and then you've got me. 